help me welcome Barry Popkin, distinguished professor from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Barry. Hi, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm really honored to be here and be honored to be working with both uh, UTech and with UE Mona in, in helping to deal with obesity prevention in this country. Um, I think I'm going to move these slides forward. Uh, Okay, uh, so I'm going to be speaking about four topics, if I could. Uh, it's kind of hard to, I'm going to roughly go through this very quickly to give you an idea of the different issues that we address in dealing with thinking about how we want to deal both, understand where physical activity fits in and the, the make a move issue, and then understand, okay, perfect, better and understand a number of other things that relate to the background of why we're working around the globe very, very actively on regulatory and other matters to deal with global obesity. Um, first, really much of what leads us here is our biological background, which has evolved over tens of thousands of years. And and where we stand is that we, we, we inherited a set of preferences. And better, now I can. So these preferences really have come to us over, over the millennia. The sweetness preference that we all understand, which is clearly a critical part of the Jamaican life. We've had it for centuries. We've had sugar production. We've had sugar cane. And it, it, it's very critical. Excuse me, the slide. There we go. Uh, and the second area of, of beverages. We've only learned in the last 20 to 30 years that what we eat does not affect what we drink. So whether you drink water, whether you drink Coke or Pepsi, whether you drink a juice bag, whether you drink coffee with eight teaspoons of sugar or tea with several teaspoons of sugar, it has the same effect. It doesn't affect what you eat. You may think it does. You may think when you have a smoothie or a latte or you have a juice bag or Coke that it makes you full, but it has not affect your diet intake that day. We know that from thousands of studies. And so that's something new, and that's partly why we're focusing on beverages. The, the third issue is fat, and you understand from the patties you eat, from all the other deep fried food, it's part of what we love. And so these issues, along with the desire to, to, to cut exertion, have really been with us over the millennia and have had a lot to do with shaping the way we've shifted very rapidly in the last three to five decades, depending on the country, into a world where we have more overweight in every country in the world except India than we have underweight. And that is a very rapid change for the globe. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about physical activity. Physical activity is critical for our health. It's important for cardiovascular health. It helps kids in schools learn better. It has many important roles, but it cannot deal with overweight and obesity, and I'll explain why. Uh, I'll talk about something called metabolic equivalence, which is a way that we use to measure activity. And I'll show you how it shifted. I'll just jump quickly to just one country, China. We've worked with WHO and uh, other companies to do a global initiative around this area. So we're very involved in it. But activity, and I want to go to, to China. If this, there. So China began as a very high labor intensive country in around 1990 when they started automating. They were like Jamaica was in the 70s and 60s and 80s when sugarcane workers really were predominated in a very heavy work and people really expended a lot of energy. 
But over time, as China automated, and we followed them in national surveys every two years, very detailed, they dropped their effort at work. If they went down to 150 on uh, the number on the left, you would get to the point where we were just sleeping all the time. Now, we leave out personal time, but the reality is that decline in activity in China was associated with huge increases both in, in work and in home production and in leisure and in transportation with big changes in, in, in doubling in each case at least of overweight. So the, the activity decline has been critical. It's been part of why we look the way we are and why diabetes is so high and other issues. However, and, and the leisure sign, the TV viewing has exploded across the globe. But we can't, I want to talk to you about sugar and what we drink and how, how, what it would take to get rid of that. And you start with a very large bottle. And if you took a large bottle, maybe it'll be easier to show you on the common bottle that you consume. This is the smallest one that you see all the time in, the, in many stores and vending machines. This eight ounce bottle has about a 236 milliliters, 237 milliliters of, of beverage, has eight teaspoons of sugar in it. And it would take, if you walk at more than a fast pace, it would take you a mile to offset that. Or 10 minutes of really fast running. This, is kind of a very conservative figure, but it's for high speed. So for an average Jamaican walking, we're talking probably a mile and a half at a slow pace. So that's what it would take to offset one little can of Coke. And you go to the larger Cokes, and the, the normal drinks and bigger drinks that people consume, and you see that it would take a mile and a half or more miles. And you see we're talking about nine teaspoons of sugar in that. That's a lot of sugar, and that's more than you need in the day. But the reality is that we can't offset that can of Coke. We can't offset that juice bag by walking or running. It just doesn't work in this world today. And we don't see people doing it. And that's the reason why we're focused so much on food and changing first what we drink and later other factors. And we'll move on. Uh, so in the globe, and I'm not gonna spend much time on this, we have really seen in the last 20 years in every country in the world, large increases in caloric sweeteners in all the food, but particularly in beverages and particularly consuming beverages. So as was mentioned, the 40% increase in the last few years in, sh in sugary beverages in this country, plus the unmentioned and unmeasured increase in juice bags and so forth have led to really what's happening in every country in the world. A very rapid increase in sugary beverage intake. But we've also had other things going on that we know we have to address later. We've had increases in lots of refined carbohydrates. We no longer eat the, the beans and all the other healthy foods that we ate before. We've really shifted to convenience, to snack food, to, to a very different kind of diet. And there's a lot of other changes that we'll ultimately have to deal with here. But the, the issue with sugary beverages, and I'm not gonna go through all of this, is when you drink a beverage, one of the things that happens is it gets absorbed very quickly. Half of the sugar goes into the liver where it's affected and it creates something. It creates something that not only affects fatty liver disease and affect insulin and other things directly as was talked about, but it has profound other cardiometabolic effects and that fat stays around the heart and the liver. So it's very, very bad for diabetes, heart disease, and 12 of the 15 major cancers, the top cause of those cancers is obesity. It is not just only heart disease. It is not just diabetes and hypertension or liver cancer. So a lot of it comes through these metabolic pathways, but the one that we're concerned with, in particular, and why we focus on beverages, is that if you drink, if you eat watermelon, 
on the bottom of the food, that's the right-hand side of the yellow color there, you will eat much less calories in the day than if you drink the watermelon juice. The same for coconut milk versus coconut meat, the same for milk versus cheese. Whatever you drink affects other than Jamaica moves has been going on. So we are really moving forward. There's lots, Mech Arancha Cochera, professor who will present next, will show some of the evaluation work we've been doing in Mexico. We're equally studying and learning about the, the really powerful effects of a negative front of the package profile in papers we're publishing on Chile, where other countries are studying this. And we are moving to the point where now, along with the countries mentioned above, over 25 other countries have sugary beverage taxes. It is going, and we have like another five or six just happening in, the, in April this year, and it's continuing. So this is really one of the things that the globe, most countries, certainly every country in the Commonwealth, as I'll show you in a map, is thinking of ways to deal with this. So it's Jamaica's turn. Uh, Chile is one of the ones that's using it through education. It's put these negative logos for too much calories, sodium, unhealthy saturated fats or sugar on packages. Those packages can't be sold in schools. They can't be brought into schools. They can't be sold around schools. They created these nutrition criteria. They also can't be marketed. So they use them, but they needed that first and they moved from that into doing a number of things. Other countries are starting to copy that. Israel's doing identical. There are five or six other countries planning to do the same kind of thing following the Chilean model. Just like we have the Mexican model that helped us understand the taxes could work, Chile is helping us understand that these can work. So let me just give you an idea. I want to show you first in the Americas. Look at the countries already doing sugary beverage taxes, but we have a whole bunch of, of cities in the US and we have a set of islands and we have a whole nother set considering, Go keep going. This is now Europe and you see the countries either starting or soon in April, Ireland and the UK go on. And then we go to Asia, you've got India with a 40% tax, you've got uh, other countries with higher. So you have countries in every region in the world doing the tax. So now let's talk about labeling. So we have two countries, Israel and Chile, which are doing the very negative logo. We have other countries doing what the industry has wanted them to do, put a positive logo for a small percent of healthy food or do the traffic lights, but they haven't required that legally, uh, which both are not as effective as this negative Chilean approach, which is why the Pan American Health Organization, the European, WHO group that EMRO and others are pushing the Chilean kind of model with the negative logos so that that is happening. But most countries are doing voluntary things and we need regulation. Voluntary means the companies have something they want to say, we'll do it, but they won't do it for other products and it's not required. So then let's talk about marketing. We already are seeing marketing laws starting in a number of countries. Chile is the strongest where they're banning from 6 a.m. starting this April, May to 10 p.m. No marketing of any of these unhealthy foods. And after that, if they market them, they're gonna have a warning message, just like with the tobacco package. This is not healthy. So, and then we have tons of countries with industry doing voluntary self-regulation. And what we know, is that that voluntary self-regulation does not work. We have dozens of studies from country to country to show it does not work. It does not affect what kids see. It has been completely ineffective. We have found in the marketing area, in the front of the package profiling area, in the area of trying to get reformulation, we need laws. We need a law that affects everybody in the industry so they have to follow a certain approach. So this is really the beginning. We are only learning about how to deal with obesity. We are only learning how to help use diet to prevent diabetes, hypertension, other forms of heart disease, and many of the cancers. We have on the world level, all of the major societies in the diabetes, in the heart, 
in the cancer area saying dealing with obesity, getting a healthy diet is critical. You have the World Cancer Research Federation saying number one target, sugary beverages. So the fact is that this is really a global kind of movement. Countries are recognizing and starting to act. And we know that the first step is with the fiscal policy, but we know the second step is creating within each country nutrient profiling systems that then will allow us to get out of the schools all the horrible food that you know the observer talked about this last weekend for Jamaica and that really exists here. And we, but we have a lot more to learn. So this is really the beginning steps of the world starting to take on this issue of obesity and all the diet related problems. And so we have a long way to go. We know to get back to healthy diet, healthy living. So I don't wanna make it seem like we have all the answers, but we have some answers and we know they're working and we know they're helping to make for a, a better world. And that's what we're moving on right now. Next. And so this is where we want to end. And I thank you with that. Is there time for questions or do you want to move on? No, no, no. We can um, invite, uh, we are behind time, but certainly a presentation like that should be generating some questions or some comments. I understand that we have 75, 76 persons logged in. So they're invited to write their questions if they wish, and they would be broadcast here and get their responses. So we have another audience out there. Anybody has any comment or any question for Professor? Hmm. If not, oh yes, please, uh, Professor Golding. You mentioned that the only exception was India. Um, you, you mentioned that the only exception was India in terms of obesity. Why is that so? No. India has over 100 diabetic cases, but India still has a half a billion undernourished people. That's all I meant was that India is the only country where maybe the dominance of undernutrition is still really prevalent. But they're, they're taxing sugary beverages there because we're finding in every country in the world that now about a third of the infants every day I'm talking about zero to six month old, six to 12 months old are being fed junk food or sugary beverages. So that it's a problem for undernutrition as well as overnutrition. 